All right, we turn now to volume two. Now, I have a choice as professor. We can follow the canonical order and insert John at this point. But um, because of the neglect that uh, the book of Acts has suffered over the history of the church, and, uh, and because of its canonical location that uh, to this day most believers uh, don't see the connection between the gospel and the book of Acts, that uh, I made a decision, well, 23 years ago when I started teaching this course, that uh, we would go right from Luke into Acts. Now, as far as the history of interpretation, Acts was read. Now, that's not really a, a major generation in the church where, uh, uh, where Acts was not known. But as I've already stated, as far as being studied and preached, um, Acts fell by the wayside. As we have seen, even the Gospel of Luke uh, really was third in influence after Matthew and John because Luke was not an apostle. So all we can say for 1,900 years of church history is, well, at least Luke, for the first uh, approximately 1,700 years of that time, was uh, read and studied more than Mark. But even that has flipped in uh, the last couple hundred years. But as I said, after World War II, there's been a resurgence. And about the last 70 years, the last generation of interest in Luke and the book of Acts because of its uh, vital role that it plays in the New Testament. And uh, so you can read a work like uh, Goss' work, A History of the Interpretation of Acts of the Apostles, and you're going to find that uh, a lot of his discussion is uh, what has taken place over about the last 150 years, and particularly what's taken place over the last uh, 70 years. So we might put it this way, Acts is ignored no more. Now, it was always viewed as giving a historical foundation, historical basis, particularly for what was in the rest of the New Testament. Uh, but now, more and more study of Acts in its own right. Acts as a standalone book. And I've already said the two great reasons for that were the modern missionary movement and the modern uh, Pentecostal slash charismatic movement that have m made much of what is in Acts, which has forced exegetes to go back and and read closely what is in the book of, of Acts. And I'm not so sure that as we get into our discussion, uh, brief as it is of Acts, that uh, we, might, uh, we, 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 we might question some of the stereotypes that you've heard about Acts uh, in the past. Now, certainly whoever wrote the Gospel of Luke wrote the book of Acts. And as we've seen, that there are really only two viable candidates out of the Pauline missionary team. And uh, that was Luke and Titus. And, uh, the, and it's significant that the writer of Acts uh, also wrote what became a canonical gospel. Uh, because by the end of the first century, those canonical gospels were already being associated with their authors, according to Luke. Uh, so we, we know basically because of the gospel and the church tradition about the gospel who the author of the book of Acts was. And again, the reader, once again, is Theophilus, a representative of Gentile Christians. And this is written probably, most probably, about four years after the, uh, the gospel of Luke. So we will assume that Luke wrote the gospel while he was in Palestine. Uh, Acts chapter uh, 21 went with uh, 
uh, Paul to Jerusalem. And uh, while Paul is arrested, taken to Caesarea, spent two years in prison there. Uh, during that time is when he completed his researches and uh, wrote the, uh, the Gospel of Luke. But significantly, even the Gospel itself was not enough in and of itself to answer all the questions that Theophilus had would answer a, a, a good number in uh, certainly showing that God's plan in sending Jesus as Israel's Messiah also was that the message might go to the Gentiles as well. It was uh, not only a light to Israel, but also a light to the nations, this salvation, that uh, this was... Uh, this was a message that was for all peoples with whom God was well pleased. And even the, that's at the very beginning in Luke chapter 2, but even in Luke chapter 24, that uh, Jesus has commissioned the, uh, the disciples beginning in Jerusalem to take uh, this message of forgiveness to all nations. And uh, so definitely we have in 2447 that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. That is Jesus' mandate. That is Jesus' commission to his apostles uh, that we see in the culmination of Luke. Now, a further question arises from Luke chapter 24. All right, so Jesus commissioned his apostles to take the message of forgiveness to the Gentiles. Did they? And in doing so, did that message continue to be the same message of salvation that Jesus had proclaimed to Israel while he was here with his incarnate ministry upon the earth. Uh, all right, so Luke, you've given me assurance that, that this was Jesus' plan and purpose, that this message of salvation come to me. But is that message that Jesus commissioned to come to me, has it at all changed? in that time period from Jesus to me. And so uniquely because of Luke's purpose. He had a further question to answer that obviously the other gospel writers didn't have to answer. So it wasn't Matthew, it wasn't Mark, it wasn't John. Uh, their gospels, if we can put it that way, put it this way, were self-contained. Now Luke's was self-contained as far as it went, but it still doesn't answer the ultimate issue because if Theophilus has to respond to Judaizers, the Judaizers themselves said they were disciples of Christ, that they acclaim Jesus as Messiah. They acclaim Jesus as Savior. And in fact, they had no problem with the fact that Gentiles were to receive salvation. But they didn't think that that salvation of Gentiles was complete until the Gentiles were circumcised and kept the law. Acts chapter 15. And uh, this is the, uh, the reason, I believe, why uh, Luke, uh, certainly in chapter 11, after uh, Peter was sent by the Holy Spirit to the house of Cornelius, and then asked to answer for what historically took place, narrated chapter 10, in the first 18 verses of Acts chapter 11, 
that when he shared how the Spirit had led him and the response of the Gentiles in Cornelius' house to the message, when they heard all this, 1118, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well then, God has granted to Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. It's your Gentile salvation resolved. The fact that they could be saved. But then there's a greater issue. On what basis were they saved? Just in faith in Jesus alone? Or with the addition of circumcision and law keeping as well? Now, we know the Pauline gospel from uh, certainly seeing the, uh, the emphasis in Paul's letters, particularly Romans and Galatians when we get there. But, uh, but Luke now takes the painstaking way of saying, all right, let me show you the development of the, the continuation, the ongoing of that message of forgiveness commissioned by Jesus to the apostles as seen in the, the years between Jesus and you, Theophilus. And so he needs a follow-up volume. That uh, his, his task is uh, not fulfilled just with the Gospel of Luke. And so we have the book of Acts. And uh, we should be very, very thankful that we do. Now, what themes do we see in the book of Acts? Well, the themes that we've already introduced as far as Luke and Acts together. We continue to see in the book of Acts the outworking of God's sovereign plan. Beginning in Acts chapter 1 with uh, the fact that Judas had to be replaced. In fact, he had to be replaced because the Old Testament had already predicted that uh, one man from the apostles would, uh, would deny the, uh, the Lord. That's exactly what had taken place. But particularly the fact that with that denial, that one needed to take his place. Uh, 121, therefore it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism until the day when uh, baptism of John, until the day he was taken up from us, one of these should become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they put forth two men, one is chosen. And at the end of, uh, of uh, 126, Matthias was numbered with the 11 apostles. And by the way, from then on, as far as Luke is concerned, beginning in chapter 2, when Peter stood up, he stood with the 11. And so we either have one apostle with the 11, or we have the 12. Uh, when we get to... Uh, uh, to Acts in chapter 6, verse 2. The twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples. All right. Uh, there is, as Luke speaks, he, he speaks of this group in Jerusalem as uh, the eleven plus one or the twelve. The end of Acts 1, it's the 11 plus Matthias. Chapter 2, it's the 11 plus Peter. And uh, chapter 6, it's the 12. And that's the way he refers to this group uh, the rest of the time through the book of, of Acts. So as far as he is concerned, there were 12, 12 apostles in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. 
And, of course, there's going to be a further apostle, but that is, uh, is not one of these 12. It is going to be a man in addition to the 12. And take a look at chapter 9, because once again, we have the outworking of God's sovereign plan. This is where the Lord is speaking to Ananias. Ananias, um, arise, go to the street called Straight, verse 11. Inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he's praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in, lay his hands on him, so he might regain his sight. So Ananias, you get the, you get the joy of looking up. Saul of Tarsus, and uh, going and laying hands on him so that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man. I don't see this as a gracious act on your part, Lord. How much harm he did to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest and all who call upon your name. Uh, Lord, I don't know if you know exactly who this man is. I have received the reports. We, we've heard from Jerusalem. We know that what this man is all about. We know why he's come to Damascus. He's, he's come to, well, he's, he's come to bind all who call upon your name. And you're asking me? To go to the street, find out the house, where he is. Hi, Saul. I'm a believer. I know why you're here. All right. Here's my hands. Bind me. Take me back to Jerusalem. Now, I know you've never told the Lord anything like that in your prayers. Um, Lord, you really don't know what you're talking about. But uh, Ananias very subtly gives the Lord information. But verse 15, the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. So notice in verse 15, clearly, He's a chosen vessel, God's choice, God's plan. And it is necessary for him to suffer. And so his ministry and even the suffering associated with that ministry is God's sovereign plan and purpose. So in verses 15 and 16, we see the same emphasis of God's sovereign plan in the life of Paul, by the way, that uh, echoes what Peter said on the day of Pentecost concerning Jesus. Acts 2.23, this man delivered up by the predetermined plan and knowledge of God. In the same way that God chose Jesus for his task. He has chosen Paul for his task as well. And uh, this is going to be the first echo of many uh, where Paul, uh, of all individuals in the book of Acts, echoes what we see in the life and ministry of, of Jesus. Now, as you go through the book of Acts, not only do you see the outworking of God's sovereign plan, I've just given you a couple of, of illustrations of that, examples of that. But throughout the, uh, the gospel, we see an emphasis upon the preaching of the word. Beginning in chapter 2 with Peter's message on the day of Pentecost, all the way to Acts chapter 28 and Paul's message to the Jews in Rome. 
In fact, the preached word in the book of Acts is a word given for the purpose of bringing unbelievers to faith. That, that really is the, the proclamation that is seen in Acts. And therefore, all of the messages center around the death and resurrection and exaltation of Jesus. And of those three particulars, the one that is most emphasized again and again and again is the resurrection of Jesus. Because it was the, the resurrection which validated the meaning of his death and certainly was the experience necessary for him to be exalted to, to heaven. And, uh, and so, uh, particularly as, as you go through the book of Acts, there is the, the particular emphasis upon his resurrection. And in fact, in, in chapter 5, this was the problem that the, the Sanhedrin had, that uh, the apostles had filled, you know, Jerusalem with the, uh, the message of, uh, of, the, of the resurrection. And uh, uh, so, uh, so that's why they were, they were upset. They were, they were angry. And uh, so the particular emphasis upon the fact that Jesus has been resurrected. Third of all, as you go through the book of Acts, you see an emphasis upon the rejection of Jesus as Messiah by Israel. It uh, begins in Acts chapter 7. It begins at the stoning of Stephen. That uh, they refuse to, to listen to his, to his message. And uh, by the time he gets to the conclusion of his message in Acts chapter 7, they either have to uh, repent or they have to put Stephen to death. Notice in verse 51, You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. When he's done, verse 54, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they were gnashing their teeth at him. Uh, by the time Stephen is done, there's either going to be great revival or great persecution. They're either going to respond in repentance, or they're going to respond with attack. You might put it this way, they'll repent or they'll reject, and they rejected. And uh, this continues on. Uh, chapter 13, chapter 22. And we've already seen it in chapter 28. So this continuing theme that as the, as the message of Jesus Christ, Jesus as Messiah, is heard beginning in Jerusalem and then to Jews of the Diaspora synagogues, uh, there, is, uh, there is rejection. In fact, the only Jewish synagogue that has a positive response is in Acts 17 at Berea. Every other synagogue culminating with the Jews in Rome. Now, Paul was under house arrest. He couldn't go to their synagogues. They had to come to him. But outside of Berea, always rejection and persecution of Paul. He must suffer many things. Yet, not only does the book of Acts emphasize rejection by Israel, but conversely, it, uh, 
It emphasizes the acceptance of Jesus by the, by the Gentiles. Now, the book of Acts is, is not every Jew rejected and every Gentile repented. But uh, certainly the thrust is the majority of Israel rejected and in contrast, a significant number of Gentiles responded with repentance. So that uh, certainly, that by the time you get to the end of, of, book, of the book of Acts, we might put it this way, the, the response to the gospel had become predominantly a Gentile thing. And the resulting church was... Gentile. Now certainly a theme, though not the purpose, is the establishment of the church through the ministry of the apostles. Now early on in the book of Acts, uh, Luke does not refer to this new phenomenon as, as a, a church. Uh, he refers to it obviously as, as a, a oneness of believers, a unity of, uh, of individuals. It's not until you get to chapter 5, verse 11, where he finally refers to this entity as the church, and great fear came upon the whole church. And, of course, assume the church is uh, those who have come to faith in, in Jesus. And uh, still, uh, that even though we have uh, the church, the, the emphasis continues to be, while the believers were in Jerusalem, that they were, they were a sect. Uh, they, they were part of what was taking place in Jerusalem. They still went to the te temple. They, they went to the temple to pray. They went to the, the temple to learn. That is, that uh, in the, the porticos, where the teachers would be, that's where the apostles would, uh, would go regularly, and, uh, and they would teach. And it wasn't really until the events associated with Stephen and the persecution that the believers were forced out of Jerusalem, and uh, that now, as we get to 8.1, and a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem and they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except for the apostles. So certainly from this point on this, this, this group is going to be known as church and particularly as they get away from Jerusalem. Uh, they are a unique, uh, a unique group um, and church can be singular and obviously churches can be plural. And uh, so wherever the gospel goes, ultimately, we start to see churches being established. But, um, and this was predominance in the church tradition, that Acts, really, its ultimate purpose is the establishment of the church and the growth of the church. But we have to say that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Luke gets a long way into his narrative before he really starts to talk about the church. And st as you go through the narrative, it doesn't talk that much about churches. So it's more that uh, the church is the result of what is seen in the book of Acts and not so much the purpose of the book of Acts. Also, an emphasis upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but this continues on as we've already seen from the Gospel of Luke. And at least twice, lengthy narratives, chapter 11, where we're already referred to, and again in chapter 15, the famous Jerusalem Council. But lengthy controversy about this whole matter of Gentile salvation. Can the Gentiles be saved? Chapter 11, yes. On what basis are the Gentiles saved? Chapter 15. Tremendous emphasis upon prayer and the obedience of God's people. Probably this 
ties once again in to the sovereign plan and purpose of God. The believers were obedience. And particularly the apostles were obedient to God's leading. But Luke doesn't want us as Gentiles to think that God is through with Israel. In chapter 3, he makes it very, very clear that God will fulfill the promises he has made to Israel through the prophets of the Old Testament. Verse 21, that Jesus has been now received in heaven until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times, or from ancient time, singular. So um, there is an anticipation still that God is not through with, with Israel. Now let me, uh, before we do the purpose, let's uh, move on into literary structure. And, uh, and then we'll come back and, and uh, see the, uh, the purpose of the book of, of Acts. Certainly as you go through the book of Acts, before you get to the outline, I've given you a couple of uh, charts. As you go through the book of Acts, you st should, as you read, say, I've read something like this before. And uh, you can see that uh, with all of uh, these narrative features, that uh, there is a, a narrative given in uh, the first 12 chapters, and uh, then we find out that as we go through that uh, some of these are, well, all that I've listed here are echoed when we get into the end of chapter 12 and on through the rest of the book. For instance, uh, in both cases, uh, the events in chapter 1, the events in chapter 12, inaugurate in Jerusalem. Uh, there's also assembled prayer. Believers assembling together and, uh, and uh, coming to know the will of, of God. There is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, which leads to apostolic preaching. We'll come back to this with a tremendous correspondence between what Peter preaches in chapter 2 and what Paul preaches in chapter 13. Even, uh, e even going back and, and uh, picking some of the same Old Testament texts that are emphasized. Chapter 3, and then chapter 14. A healing of a lame man who's been lame from his mother's womb. And both texts emphasize that fact. Life, lung, lame man. By the way, uh, that is healed in both cases by fixing their gaze upon the instrument God uses to heal them. Look at me. Followed by a speech that begins, Men, why? Why are you amazed? Why are you wondering at what takes place? And after leading to the persecution of the apostles involved. What God is doing brings dissension among the believers. We have a mission to the Gentiles. Significantly in chapter 10, beginning with a vision where a man says, come. And where a Gentile company is ready. And where one ultimately has to go and defend what he has done in Jerusalem. Now, though Paul's ministry does not begin in the same way, 
It is interesting that, um, well, Peter has been ministering for a while. We've seen how the Lord has used him. And then this particular event to go to Cornelius' house. Same thing, Paul has been called. Paul has been ministering. And then uniquely, he sees a vision in chapter 16 with a man from Macedonia saying, come. With the establishment of a Gentile company and ultimately... This is part of Paul's ministry that he has to go and defend in Jerusalem in chapter 21. Now, significantly, the, uh, the instrument of taking the message of the Gentiles is imprisoned. And both times in Jerusalem, though Peter is miraculously released and uh, Paul just gets sent to Caesarea and ultimately to Rome. By the way, God also sovereignly de determines whether you get out of prison or whether you stay a prisoner, according to the book of Acts. And through it all, the success of the word. That uh, nothing could stop the ongoing of the word of God. That at the end of the book, the messenger might be in prison, but the message was not. And even the imprisonment in chapter 12 cannot stop the word of the Lord continuing to grow and to be multiplied in 1224. By the way, this becomes therefore very, very important. The emphasis is not so much upon the men as it is upon the message. It is the message that is going forth, the message that is uh, not being hindered, even if the men are. So, uh, so that's, I've heard this before. Then you start to look at the major components of these comparisons, and you start to recognize that, all right, most of the events we're talking about, most of the messages we're talking about in the first 12 chapters focus on Peter. And then beginning in chapter 13, they focus upon Paul. Both are filled with the Spirit. Both have a message to the men of Israel. Both heal a lame man. Both raise a dead person. Both confront a magician. Both can heal uh, without physically touching. Both have prison chains loosed. Both have a trance while praying, a vision of the Lord while praying. Both have visions which leads to preaching. Both are addressed by angels. Both have three significant evangelistic messages recorded in the book. Distinction, Peter has two to Israel and one to Gentiles. Paul has one to Israel and two to Gentiles. Why are chapter 2 and chapter 13 so very, very vital and important? Because essentially Peter and Paul preach the same message. It's the same message of how Jesus is shown based upon the Old Testament to be the Messiah and how the Messiah has died and been raised. And now forgiveness, repentance can be preached in the name of Jesus. Same message on the day of Pentecost. Same message in the synagogue of Pisidian of Antioch. The same message responded to by Jews in chapter 2 and at the end of chapter 13 with the Gentiles re rejoicing that the message has come to them. Same message. Same response of repentance. And basically what Peter preached to to Israel, chapter 10, he preaches to Gentiles. And essentially what Paul had preached to Israel, chapter 13, with great Gentile response, not Jewish response, continues to be the message as we see it in chapters 14 and 17. Now, obviously, you could take many of these same uh, statements filled with the Holy Spirit, message to men of Israel, healing of a lame man, raising of a dead person, and uh, realize that uh, what was true of Peter and Paul had previously been seen in the ministry of, of Jesus. And here, 
is where we see Luke and Acts. Luke is about Jesus and what Jesus did and uh, what Jesus spoke. And when we get to the book of Acts, we have Peter and we have Paul and they did and they spoke. And what began with Jesus continues with Peter and what Peter did and what Peter spoke. I'm sorry, it's not spike, spoke. Paul does as well. And what Luke is clearly showing is, is that, all right, what Theophilus had heard through Paul is exactly what Israel had heard through Jesus and then through Peter. And so as we conclude for today, all right, what was the purpose of the book of Acts? The purpose of uh, the book of Acts relates to the word, to the apostolic witness, to the testimony to Jesus Christ, proclaimed the spread in accordance with the plan of God from Jerusalem to Rome. It's significant that Acts begins in the center of Judaism and ends in the center of the Gentiles. Begins in Jerusalem, ends in Rome. And along the way, this message was proclaimed to both Jews and Gentiles. So from Acts 10 on, it's proclaimed to Gentiles, but throughout the book of Acts, it's proclaimed to Jews. And it's the same message. The same essential message of Jesus as Messiah, given as Savior and Lord for the forgiveness of sins in response to faith and repentance is the same message that is seen throughout the book of Acts. That, we might put it this way, the hero of the book of Acts, the, 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 the human hero is the proclaimed message. It's not the messenger, it's the message. And of course, that message comes from God. That message is about Jesus Christ. That message is enabled and empowered by the Holy Spirit to accomplish God's plan and God's purpose. And so really, the, the book of Acts is about the advancement of the word, the preached testimony of what God has done in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit in that proclamation with the result that God's plan is accomplished. That's the purpose of the book of Acts. And Theophilus, that word has come under God's sovereign design to you. And by the enablement of the Holy Spirit, you have responded. And now Christ is your Savior and your Lord. And that's your assurance of forgiveness of sins and salvation. It's not what you do. It's what you believe God did through Jesus Christ. And um, historically, Luke has uh, given a historical record that, as we said previously, undergirds, therefore, the theology that we're going to see in the Pauline letters and the rest of the letters of the New Testament as well. But uh, Luke is writing more than mere history. He is writing a theological history which undergirds the theology of the rest of the New Testament.